From the Fathead Studio in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Man, am I still pretty? And he's like, you ain't pretty, but you're going to be all right. Now I'm just hanging on, looking at the wall, like flying this way. I'm like, oh, man, I got to let go of this thing at some point. And then there's one that could literally pick you up. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, I'm not really sure about that, but yeah. That's called a helicopter. Well, <laughs> and the last lap was just chaos. I mean, like four wide, five wide. It's like, whatever. If you land it and send it into the fence, you're probably not going to get hurt. Bounce and then this insane roll, the car that Keegan was in. I mean, it. I don't know if it's the shape of the Beetle or what, but that thing sent it. So I was a supercharger specialist on my uh, old man's car. With specialist? Robert. Yeah, it sounds cooler than crew guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am Tony Stewart. I'm Mario Andretti. I'm Christy Lee. I'm Alexander Rossi. I'm Cruz Pedregon. Hello, I'm Andrew Hines. I'm Eddie Krawick. I'm Gage Herrera, and this is The Skinny. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. We're here in Speedway, Indiana at the Fatheads Eyewear Studio, and I am surrounded by Vance and Hines royalty here today. This is going to be an exciting show for sure. Sitting there alongside me at the V-Desk for victory. No, that is not Rico Elmore, a much thinner, better-looking version, and boy, can he <laughs> ride a motorcycle, no doubt about it. Welcome, Andrew Hines. He is sitting alongside. Of course, the guy running the controls, as always, is the track dude, Mr. Michael Young. Slow down. There's too many buttons I need to hit. Hold on, okay, baby. Hold Stick on, with baby. me, man. Okay. These guys got me ramped up. You can't be slow on this show. And then, of course, sitting straight across from me is good friend, longtime friend, Mr. Eddie Krawick, a four-time NHRA Pro Stock champ. By the way, Andrew's six-time NHRA Pro Stock champ. And then some guy named Gage Herrera. I'm not... He's brand new to the game, man. I don't know what, what he's been doing, but clearly riding a pro stock motorcycle is not much of a challenge since he's been to, what is it, seven of nine finals, winning six of them and eight number one qualifiers. I mean, what's the big deal over here, guys? Just hop on a bike and go get her done, right? I mean, nothing to it. Nope, not really. I mean, uh, it's been an incredible season so far. <laughs> he tries to make it look easy. Yeah, right. This is the hardest thing he's done all year. Yeah. It's, he might struggle with a microphone. Uh -huh. He certainly does not struggle behind the wheel of a motorcycle. That's for sure, man. Welcome to the show, guys. It is awesome to have the Vance and Hines lead in here. It's, it's a pleasure. It's great to be here. You know, we've had past history here and uh, had a great time. So we figured might as well come back again and introduce the new guy to it. Yeah, absolutely. We've been trying to work these schedules out. That is, I always tell people that's the most difficult part of it between our schedules, your schedules, and getting people in here. We love to have people in the studio, of course, and that's uh, what we've been working on. Wanted to get Gage in here, uh, you know, a little bit earlier, but as we continue to wait, his resume just grows. So <laughs> it, it, it's like wine. It's just getting better with time. I, I was delaying it. We we're like, man, this kid's going to be a champion before <laughs> we even get in there. So uh, it's it's been... Uh, it's been an interesting thing trying to work that out. You know, Gage has a real job. We have real jobs, and uh, come not on. just racing on, come you know, on. racing on weekends. We don't have real jobs. Does any of us work a job? Come job. on, man. <laughs> no, it's uh, you know, working for Vance Nines is great, but you know, great Gage is the working man's hero. You know, he's out there. He's a pipe fitter, and he's working up up in steel mills, doing all kinds of stuff, and, and banging knuckles and almost taking off fingers before the U.S. Nationals. So. He's, uh, you know, it, luckily he was in one piece coming to this racetrack. <laughs> did you sign a multi-year contract? No, nope, did not. No, next year, maybe you won't have to fit pipe next year. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> so I'm up for grabs, guys. Right? We're going to raise the verse here a little bit. Hey, man, talk to me about how this all happened. I want to go back. I want to talk about your experience and how you got to where you're at. It's certainly going to be a big part of the show here. But as we sit around... Andrew and, and Eddie, two of the absolute best to ever climb behind the, uh, the wheel of one of these Pro Stock motorcycles. They clearly saw something in you. So uh, I don't know who saw it first. Was it you, Andrew, or you, Eddie? But I know both of you guys are paying attention, and this guy caught your eye. What? He made his debut in 2022, which, by the way, good and bad. I heard you ran just enough events that you don't qualify for <laughs> yeah. Rookie of the Year this year, which you clearly should, uh, should be dominating. But... Um, so I think six events in 2022, but that's what caught somebody's eye here. One I, of the, one I of think both here. of us saw it. You know, he, uh, I went up there. He was riding for uh, Karen and Gary Stouffer, riding their, uh, as they call their rental bike. And, you know, they were sending it down the track. I walked up to the starting line with Gary, and uh, he popped the clutch and went. And I was like, I turned and looked at Gary, and I said, if that's the way he's going to ride, you're going to be all right. And then that's where Andrew comes in. Andrew's 
at home sick with COVID watching it on the TV. I hadn't been at a racetrack. That's the first time I missed a race in 25 years. Wow. Because I went racing with my brother the, for the three years before I started running. And that's the first time I hadn't seen a pro stock bike go down the track live since the 90s, right? And the first person I see when I'm sitting in my basement on my theater watching NHRA.TV was Gage Herrera. He's on a competition single, first bike down the track, and just the, the natural behavior he had, his mannerisms on the bike, just from burnout box to the starting line, and then his, his subtle finesse that he did going down the track, which was like his third run ever on a bar bike since he's a pro street racer by nature and a grudge racer on a you know, faster motorcycle than he races now. But he just he did all the right things and just that one run that caught my attention. And I knew if we were looking to make a change for next year, if there was an opportunity for that, from that point on, I had to watch this kid all through the countdown. And I secretly studied his, his reaction times through qualifying because we get the qualifying you know, breakdown sheets every run and saw where he was on the tree and just watched him progress. And we went to de- uh, testing in Dallas. That's when the Stopers yeah. uh, got their full upgrade on their two-valve engine. He had more of a potential to run farther into the pack. And they tested that day, and I watched them all through testing. Kind of, you know, we were helping them line up, do whatever, pick a good spot for them while we were testing there as well. And the kid did a phenomenal job. And we were just, we were, yeah. we were kicking back in Vegas, and uh, he was there. And I think it was uh, early Friday. Yeah, it was. Fri- it was Friday. We were getting ready to test. We were, we were getting ready to make some runs, but we were going to test. Yeah. We decided to test. We, on we were pitted right next bike. to Suzuki out there midway, and his his Gage's dad just went walking by to go check out the all the stock motorcycles on display. And I said, "Hey, Augie." Gage going to be here on Monday? And he looked at me. He's like, does he need to be? You know, it was like <laughs> quick little little hint there. And I said, well, you know, we're looking at testing Ed's bike. And I just, you know, if he's around, maybe he could make a lap or two. We were looking at testing some combustion sensor stuff. So we had to run a laptop on the bike and, you know, 15, Ed, pounds, Ed 15 worth of, pounds of weight worth, yeah. worth of stuff. I'm like, well, you know, that's about the difference in the guys. We can run at weight with all the combustion stuff on the bike, not affect the chassis and see, you know, give Gage a chance on a, a top tier bike. And... It was like Saturday night, and finally Augustine's like, you know, does he still need to be there on Monday? He's got to change his flight. I said, yeah, why don't you have him do well, that? Well, we could and say it now. We didn't clear any of this with our boss, Terry, or anything. <laughs> and me and Andrew were like, we're just going to do it yeah. because we need to know. This is one of those and things. <laughs> do it now and beg for forgiveness after, you know? Just get it done. And so we met with Terry and Seema after Gage rode the bike five times, and he did a phenomenal job. Actually, we we did critique him on one thing. He he, he rode the bike. We had a we had a GoPro on board, right? This is where he, he's kind of embarrassed about this. This is this is why he has a mirrored visor. This is what this the year. show's for, by the way. Yeah. Right. So, on like the second run, we we got the GoPro on, and he's going down the track, and he's going nice and straight, but he's looking around like. <laughs> <laughs> his like, eyes are wandering. <laughs> he's going perfectly straight down the track. We're like, what are you looking at? You know, there's a flagpole with a with a breeze blowing. I'm like, are you looking for the big screen or what are you what are yeah, you watching? Yeah. Or like, are you looking for the scoreboard? No, the first thing he said is, I need a darker visor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but then he's like, I don't even realize I'm doing this. So it, he just got real quiet in the trailer and he was like She would let the clutch go and let the almost the bike accelerate out from underneath her and then have to grab back onto it. Uh, Gage is completely opposite. He, he could probably, <laughs> he's ahead of if him. he wasn't holding on to the handlebars, he'd still be on the bike. The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach, innovation is our life force. Welcome back to The Skinny. I'm Ken Stout. That is Andrew Hines sitting right alongside. He is a crew chief for Gage Herrera in the Pro Stock Motorcycle ranks of NHRA. Of course, a six-time champ as well. And that family name of Vance and Hines, of course, uh, legendary. You guys have been phenomenal. And much more than drag racing, we should also talk about. That's a whole other show, though, for later down the road. And we have Gage on here, who is uh, certainly cutting his teeth in the NHRA Pro Stock Motorcycle ranks as well, doing a phenomenal job here in 2023, and we've yet to hear from him. Certainly, that uh, I'm gonna—I have to start off a question with you because I don't think <laughs> you were in the first segment at all. But um, let's go back and talk about when all of that was happening. We talked about you making your debut in 2022, um, and then these guys having a chance to watch you, and then getting the invite to stay over one day. And climb on a Vance and Hines bike. What were you, what was going through your head, man? Uh, I mean, uh, when I got asked to ride, you know, test Ed's bike, you know, I was looking at it as an opportunity to ride one of the top tier bikes in the class. I didn't think nothing would ever come of it more than that. You know, I was just very thankful for the opportunity, and I mean, I was just out there having fun. I really never 
That's why I did the last six races because I did, really didn't see nothing happening after that. So I wasn't worried about the rookie of the season or nothing. And uh, now I'm here, you know, living the dream for sure. So when when you were riding the bike, clearly these guys seen something. And, and Andrew, you were talking about the subtleties and the finesse, and that's what sparked all the questions in my mind. I want to know what you guys see. I mean, if I watch a short course off-road race, I'm watching how the trucks land. I'm watching how the dampers are going to work. What's a rebounder? How's a guy pitching it in? Is he driving it in? Is he flicking it? I mean, all these little things that we spend our lives in this industry, and we start seeing things that people don't see. So I, I want to know, like, what is it? Do you even know what you do that caught their eyes? I would say I, I really don't. You know, I just... I'm so comfortable on a motorcycle. I mean, I I started off dirt bike riding or dirt bike racing a lot until I started getting hurt a lot. So I kind of got away from that. And then I went back to, or my dad got me mainly into riding motorcycles on the track, drag racing. And uh, I would say, you know, just being on the, so I've ridden so many different bikes. I think that's helped me a lot um, as far adaptable. as adapt, adapting yeah. a lot. Yeah. I mean, I've been, in, uh, rode a lot of different, you know, uh, no bar bikes, either short, long. I've ridden like, very few bar bikes, I think two or three before um, basing my debut. And uh, I think that's what really helped a lot as far as riding. Yeah, and that brings up a gr another great point. Um, I learned a lot from having these guys on the show previously and the finesse of a riding a pro stock motorcycle, all the little things. And I, so now when I'm paying attention, if I see somebody have a, a bit of a rough run and I'm looking, and sometimes it is just the smallest little thing and hitting your shift points and making sure that bike's going as straight as it can go and whatever else it is that you guys do at that that level of the game but i'm really curious because i would think riding a bar bike would automatically be easier it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just the way i view it it's like okay well now he can't flip over backwards he's got yeah. bars back there but talk to me about the differences between the two other than the obvious i mean the biggest difference to me is uh the the bar bikes you know it, it Every little move makes big adjustments to where on the on the no bar bikes you basically had to throw your body off the side to get it to really do anything because most of the time the front tires not on the ground type of thing and you're riding on a seven inch street tire, um, so you could actually roll the bike over type of thing as far as turning. Where these bikes, you definitely got to finesse them. I mean, you could kill a lot of mile an hour time. I mean, in in a split of a second for sure. So that's been the biggest learning curve for me. So effectively, you're going to create a tripod, and there's the bike is essentially bound up once you get there, right? It just kind of it's going to go the way it's aimed. Yeah, that's the the whole starting line procedure, uh, and, and keep getting the bike to go as efficient as possible down the track in a straight line starts on the on the starting line. And Gage does a pretty good job of lining himself up, but we always have somebody's back by the water box that's kind of siding the bike down the track, you know, because it's it's a dart for the first 150 feet. It's pretty much going to go where it's pointed. And you want the rider to do the least amount of uh, riding to it in that time frame. So the way he rides is quite unique to the class. Uh, Gage does a, a lunge or a ram, as it's been called in the class for a while. And the way he does it is probably more advanced than a lot of people do in the class. Eddie and I never really yeah. did that. I mean, I'd, the way I'd, our, say, I'd say it is the most advanced yeah. in the class. The way, and it, like Gage kind of developed that from his pro street bike, learning that he needed to do something different with his shock and, and, and his, his chassis setup for his seven inch slick. And it's actually worked really well on the pro stock bike where I can run the wheelie bar higher now, which you need at different times through first gear and second gear. But the bike doesn't act like it has a high wheelie bar because he, he, moves the center of gravity forward and down so quick and and continuously for through the first five feet that it's uh it's got so much more traction i can hit the clutch different i can raise the rpm up and anything we've done to it with gear ratio and whatever it's gone quicker and quicker and quicker and more efficiently and and consistently in 60 foot I mean, we, we put up three or four 102 60 foots this year which haven't been done in the class in over 10 years and we're at the heaviest the suzuki mm -hmm. has ever been I remember you guys having a conversation talking about Angel because you could get her bike to 60 foot better because I think you were able to move her a little bit further forward. Is, is that well, that it's, it's her and the weight. Yeah, it would be those two situations that... But her you know, weight, yeah, that, I mean, effectively, ballast is good, but when you have movable ballast, right. call him 150 pounds, where he can lean one way or the other, or forward or back, I'm guessing that's what you're talking about. Yeah, so with the, you know, he, he's about 20 pounds or heavier or so heavier than Angel was, so hers was fixed ballast up front that 
didn't move with the chassis. But with him, I swear the bike thinks it's 50, 60 pounds lighter for that first 10 feet because he's going forward with it and the bike is wanting to accelerate where she had some bad habits where she would let the clutch go and let the almost the bike accelerate out from underneath her and then have to grab back onto it. Uh, Gage is completely opposite. He, he could probably... <laughs> He's ahead of If it. he wasn't holding on the handlebars, he'd still be on the bike. That's the great thing about that. So <laughs> It's definitely a unique perspective on it. I mean, Eddie and my, myself, the, the way our bikes were built were for aerodynamics down track because riding our Harleys for so long, we didn't have a fairing. So we had to be tucked and ready to go when we popped the clutch. And that we, you could notice it at 60 to 80 miles an hour, like in the first 100 feet. So we were always on quote unquote lay down bikes. Well, Gage is now sitting up almost old school Dave Schultz look. Yeah, yeah. Sitting more straight up. And then as he throws a clutch away, he gets down and tucked in the first 10 feet. And I've heard that comparison, by the way. It has to be pretty cool for you that it's kind of a Dave Schultz riding style taken to the next level, if you will. And I've also heard there's some other riders already trying to uh, implicate this, the same movement. Yeah. I mean, uh, just being being able to be compared to Dave Schultz at all, I mean, it's just it's very overwhelming, you know. And uh, yeah, I've had quite a few writers actually ask me how I do it, but I can't even ex- explain. Oh, you can it. give them an answer. You don't have to tell them the right ones. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Just go back to the very beginning. Maybe you did it wrong a couple times, and tell them that's what you did. You know. Yep. So. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty cool to hear you guys talk about this. And I totally forgot about Schultz sitting. He was almost yep. vertical, yeah, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was. Schultz, yeah. Schultz was a sit up guy. He basically popped the clutch and just stayed still on yeah. the motorcycle and didn't move and sat up. You think about that and, though at speed, that's like a billboard. I mean, yeah. how much quicker could he have been if he'd have leaned in? Yeah, I mean, right? twenty thirty miles an hour. You know, by by. 15 20 feet so you're already becoming an air brake so as you roll into it and throw into it it helps i mean it's a lot harder to do in time and i would say your timing is the hardest thing to do i've adapted i've done it and and i can do it but it's really hard to not screw up your whole program yeah. doing it so um for me i think the biggest thing that he does that that really takes it to the next level and andrew and i've talked about this is he doesn't, it's like he doesn't feel the G force. I mean, our stuff pulls three G's, you know, in, in the matter of five feet, it's at three G's. And he's still going into it, unlike others where we stop. So you naturally, when you start hitting the G's, you just stop. Well, he's ramming through it. And uh, it really makes a difference. You need to understand how to run the motorcycle. It takes a little bit of, uh, of a chassis change, a clutch change. I mean, I can name five different things. And, uh, you know, he just complimented our package to like to the next level, three, 400 feet. And then if you don't manage it correctly and it tries standing up on you, I mean, who wants to be going 150 miles an hour and the bike want to stand up and throw you off? Welcome back to The Skinny. Originally from La Mirada, California, now lives in DeMott, Indiana. Some people just say Brownsburg, but it's great to have Gage Herrera on the show with us here today. We're developing his skills that need to be developed, which is talking into the microphone. Clearly has everything else figured out when it comes to riding a motorcycle in the NHRA Pro Stock Motorcycle Ranks. Doing a killer job. Not necessarily the most vocal guy, but he uh, <laughs> he gets it done whenever he's on the bike, man. Great to have you guys with us, of course, with the other two Vance and Hines stars here, Andrew Hines and Eddie Craywick. Great to have all of three of you back here into the studio. And we've been talking about uh, what you did that caught these guys' eyes and obviously leading to your success here this year. Let's go back a couple of steps further and talk to me about your first ride on a motorcycle. When did you realize, I heard you say before you started off on dirt bikes, but when did you realize as, as a young kid, like, this is me, it's a natural thing for me, it all makes sense, and I just seem to do the right things at the right time? Yeah, I mean, uh, my first time ever on a motorcycle or two wheels was when I was three years old. So it, it started there, and I started racing dirt bikes really hard, or competitively, when I was seven. And then uh, that kind of ended in, when I was 15 after I broke uh, my leg two times in one year. So I was kind of over that. And then uh, my dad, I mean, I'm in the fourth generation in drag racing. My great-grandfather did Opals and Austins. And uh, then my grandfather was had a blown 68 Camaro. He raced, did uh, Pro Street and Outlaw 10.5, which my dad drove. And my dad's always been on motorcycles. My grandpa always tried steering him away from that, but that never <laughs> happened. Um, so I've always been around it my whole life. I mean, I got 
memories of being at the track with my dad, you know, in the lanes and all that at Palmdale, at LECR back in the day. And um, basically from, I've always loved two wheels. So I've, I knew I wanted to race some type of motorsport and motorcycles. And uh, yeah, once uh, my first pass ever down the drag strip, I was 16 on a Hayabusa, which is actually my current pro street bike. So it's still my same bike I got. And um, yeah, from there, I mean, I really enjoy the whole aspect of it. You know, I, I enjoy the whole working on the bike, building motors, wiring them, tuning them. I just love the overall challenge. And then the riding is the biggest challenge of them all. So that's pretty cool. So once uh, your father was able to shield you from grandfather, <laughs> he could have you chase his passion of riding a motorcycle. <laughs> I like how that kind of works out. That's pretty cool. But um, as you progressed up uh, on the bikes, well, so the Hayabusa, how quick was that when you first climbed on it? Uh, I want to say it was mid nines, like 140 miles an hour. It's basically a stock motorcycle, yeah, just yeah. lowered. And then, uh, and then obviously the bug bit, and you decided to go quicker and faster. And I want to work into some of the other sanctioning bodies. The fans that you know they'll they'll understand NHRA, of course, and the pro stock motorcycle ranks. We see that, but everybody here in this studio understands that if you go to a drag bike event. Things are vicious. Not that they're not vicious at Pro Stock. It's a different vibe. It's a different feel. It's a different level. Mm -hmm. But when you get to those drag bike events where you could have a massive feel that you have to work your way through, it is really dog-eat-dog, -dog, and that's that's where you really honed your skills. So what was the first professional sanctioning body you, you entered and, and classes that you were in? Um, well, I mean, I started off in bracket racing, did that a lot, and then I actually stopped racing motorcycles for five, six years. I drove a super comp dragster a lot and then race super gas. But uh, I really didn't get like heavy into motorcycle racing until I moved to DeMont, Indiana in 2017. And I started going out to the East Coast, um, basically chasing my dream of racing Pro Street. I started building that bike when I was a uh, sophomore in high school and it took seven years to finish. And uh, so once I moved out here, I started chasing the uh, NHRO, XDA and all that. So that's kind of when I started getting really serious on building them, tuning them. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've been doing that since like very heavy and then yeah so for the fans fill us in on the rules of of a pro street okay. bike and and the differences of a pro stock bike so my pro street bike is uh no wheelie bar uh seven inch street tire uh basically i have no i run a nitrous bike that majority of the class is all turbo so they have a lot more rules than i do um we got a certain amount of weight we got to run but the biggest rule is street tire no wheelie bar and it's got to kind of look like uh, stock appearing motorcycles, stock headlight, tail light, stuff like that. But um, basically, they're like the turbo bikes make seven, eight hundred horsepower, maybe even more now. And then my bike makes around six hundred or so, seven hundred. But I mean, they the record right now is six thirty two, at two thirty six, I believe. So they're they're vicious animals. I mean, my best is a six forty five at two ten. So and they're insane. Oh, dude, that is an absolute <laughs> monster, and no question. And in comparison to a pro stock bike, how much is that bike moving around? Oh, it's uh, as soon as you leave the start and they're moving around, whether it's washing the front end out, trying to wheelie, you know, trying to flip over type of thing. The the biggest issue with those bikes is from eighth mile on is when the power really comes in. So they, they really try washing out. I mean, I've had my uh, fair share of flipping. Uh, I flipped one bike. I bounced, I bounced off the wall. <laughs> At 180. You don't do that on a pro stock <laughs> bike. <laughs> no, you don't move it in. Well, no. Gladstone tried it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, uh, yeah, they're, uh, I would say those bikes from the eighth mile on are scary because you don't know what they're going to do. I mean, a little, I mean, I've had a body panel fly off and I almost hit a wall again. I, I think one of the things that he discredits about <laughs> those motorcycles, like the turbo bike, the nitrous bike, things like that, you know, you're relying on your electronics, progressive control, mm -hmm. or things along those lines. The bikes are somewhere between 70 and 75 inches long, but I've seen them literally stand up at a thousand foot and try to flip over. In you know? comparison to yeah. a wheelbase on a bike, on a pro stock bike. Yeah, which is 70 inches, but we got the wheelie bar. You kind of don't have to worry about that. But a pro stock motorcycle makes you know, 400 horsepower. Our bikes are what I'd like to say, um, hard to ride for the first three to 400 feet. After you get into fourth or fifth gear, it's kind of like a Cadillac, you know, it's got a big tire on it. You're just shifting and you're maintaining, just trying to hit your shift points and drive straight. A pro street bike. I mean, you're not actually using six or 700 horsepower till you're at 
three, four hundred feet. And then if you don't manage it correctly and it tries standing up on you, I mean, who wants to be going 150 miles an hour and the bike want to stand up and throw you off the back? In second gear, you're only in there six tenths of a second. So, yeah, by the time he's in third gear on the pro stock, he's just barely shifting first gear on the pro street. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. I'm Ken Stout. No, that's not Rico Elmore. That is Andrew Hines sitting right alongside. Great to have him in the studio. Yes, of Vance and Hines, that name. Of course, the track dude back behind the controls. Eddie Craywick has joined us as well as Gage Herrera. So we've been picking at some of the, uh, some of the stuff that got him to where he's at, developed his skills, and you touched on it at the end. We, you know, we've had some of the funny car drivers in here, fuel drivers in here, and we talk about how fast their brains are working when they're at the racetrack once that that tree comes down and and feeling everything that's going on inside of those cars i mean the talented champions can dissect every little split second you guys certainly are capable of that but hearing him talk about his pro street experience it has his brain going so fast that when he's on a pro stock bike albeit a very fast bike a tick slower a little calmer something a little more stable he's able to process everything that's happening again in split seconds go back to you as a crew chief and say hey i think it's doing this or it's doing that and you can verify all of that obviously via data and make some changes yeah and that's where uh it, we've progressed throughout the year with that data from gauge you know that's something i was missing unfortunately with angel on seat last year um mm -hmm. that's something when i was riding and tuning my own motorcycle you know 75 percent of the data tuning happened from the finish line to the turnoff because as i'm braking i would understand and i would think back of what did it feel like in third gear fourth gear was it wheeling did, when it set the front wheel down and that's when it slowed down was that the problem or was it the tuning that slowed us down in fourth gear there's different things that have uh that have added up to rider crew chief combo that worked out well for me but now having gauge back on on the on the team here He's really, uh, he unlocked a few more hundredths of a second that we were missing probably in the last couple seasons. And now, now when he gets on the bike, he said it's a consistent pull from starting line to finish line. And I've thrown scenarios at him like, hey, let's run the bike rich on, on fuel. Let's run the bike low on timing. I need to give him something that feels not normal so he knows what to experience on, this pro, on the pro stock bike. He's got all the experience on the pro street and grudge bikes. But to get the pro stock to make the best run possible you got to get every tenth of horsepower out of it and we don't have hundreds of horsepower to spare and we're not slowing the horsepower down uh only only through first gear it's just power manipulation after that it's all in clutch is all in and it's about how good somebody can ride it to the finish line so gage was there anything that was surprising when you got on a pro stock motorcycle that you weren't I expecting um i would say the first 100 feet i was not expecting <laughs> When you throw the clutch, there's nothing like riding a pro stock motorcycle. The way it, you know, the initial hit and everything. I'm so used to. Oh yeah, because you got a big tire and a bar now yeah. instead of a street <laughs> tire, right? That you have to finesse off the line. Now you can get it all. Oh yeah, I mean that was the biggest adjustment for me. You know, I, even though I did the lunge or ram type of deal on my pro street bike, they kind of roll out where these they roll out to a point, but they hit so hard it just it. it it knocks you in the butt, and you definitely got to be on it, or else you can be on the limiter on the one-two shift. And the gear ratio difference between his his pro street bikes and the pro stock is oh, significantly bing, bang, different, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we were talking about that the other day. He was racing just uh, last weekend prior to the U.S. Nationals, and I said, "How long does it take you to come out of first gear on your grudge bike?" And I think it's, he it was roughly like a second and a half. Yeah, second and a half. Second and a half. Wow. And the pro street. You're like third gear in second and a half on a pro street. The, the yeah. pro stock bike is is uh, 1.1 seconds out of first gear. And then in second gear, you're only in there six tenths of a second. So, yeah, by the time he's in third gear on the pro stock, he's just barely shifting first gear on a pro street. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. So did that catch you? Were you a little behind it the first couple of times you were on one? Yeah, I was definitely behind the first couple of passes. I mean, uh, I was actually short shifting the bike couple of passes because I just didn't want to be on the limiter type of thing, you know, and uh, so that's been the biggest adjustment for me, for sure, is just acclimating myself with the difference, feeling, and so on. I've hated it in past years because I've lost a bunch of points. He's losing like four races, like a cushion of it's four crazy. races. Gone. The Skinny is brought to you by American Coach. American Coach. Innovation is our life force. And Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. 
We're here at the Fatheads Eyewear Studios. This is the skinny just down the street from Indianapolis Motor Speedway and just across town from the home of the U.S. Nationals, the biggest drag race on the planet, where these guys just were a few days ago out there trying to win the most prestigious drag race. And uh, it's a big one for sure. As we are talking to Gage Herrera, of course, we have Andrew Hines and Eddie Craywick in here from Vance and Hines as well. And Gage, their new rider here for 2023. You've experienced some big-time moments on a motorcycle. You ran a handful of races a year ago. Were you ready for the U.S. Nationals? Did it bring something? Well, you made your debut here, I guess, in 2022. But now on a bike where you know, man, based on your record here this year, I could go out here and win this thing. Did it bring some pressure? Well, it brought a lot of pressure, I know. I uh, made my debut here last year, so it kind of held a special place. I mean, not only that, it's the big go. So uh, it was a lot of pressure. You know, I know I had an awesome motorcycle, but just the overall – I feel like there's a big uh, bullseye on my back right now, you know, and uh, everyone's expecting quite a bit out of me, you know, not only, you know, me, myself, but fans and, you know, my team and all that. So uh, it was definitely a lot of pressure. I mean, we we were able to, we ran good. We had a good weekend. We, you know, we uh, got a, the overall and the mission thing. So I was very happy. Yeah, I saw that where you and Eddie were battling there. And of course, <laughs> your sponsors. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's pretty cool yeah. to have to have an all missions Vance and I team in the yeah, final. We, Andrew actually called it the mission double dip. It's usually, you know, people don't <laughs> like when you double dip. So when you put two mission bikes in the final and we took all the money for the weekend, we were pretty happy with that. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. He's beat up on you a couple times now, Eddie. Uh, he's beaten up on me more than a couple times. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I get a lot of fans that walk up to me and they're like, man, a new guy. I've had seasons like that. Me and Andrew have dealt with it. Andrew's whooped my butt. I've whooped his butt, and he's whooping my butt now. So hopefully I reciprocate sometime. But, um, you know, it's uh, being a part of it all happening, I think, is the bigger joy. Right now, um, it's just it's fun going out there racing. I enjoy myself. The level of, uh, I want to call it excitement in a pit area, you know, we all have a lot of confidence in him and our abilities and everything that we can do. And it's just, it makes it really exciting going every race. Um, we have great motorcycles right now. We're looking forward to the countdown. We got my bike running really good this year, kind of working through a couple little things and uh, hiccups. And uh, unfortunately, you know, for the U.S. Nationals, we both had little mal malfunctions of mechanical stuff that's beyond our control. Um, so. I think going into the countdown, we're going to go through the motorcycles with a fine-tooth comb. We'll be ready and uh, make this an exciting last six races for us. Yeah, there's a hell of a race going on, but it's for second in the points. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is, you know, but that's the great thing about the way the countdown works. I've hated it in past years because I've lost a bunch of points. He's losing like four races, like a cushion of it's four crazy. races gone. Yeah. You know, so now I'm only, you know, three rounds behind him, essentially. If I were you, I'd keep track on the side just count it the regular season no matter how it ends and say i'm still you know the the old school champion it is pretty amazing um to, to see what's going on here and i i credit you guys you know and your team the vance and heinz team because not only are you winning now but you've managed to do that over the course of how long how old's the business that was it in the 70s 1979 is yeah i mean you continue to find talent and keep that talent under the tent. The, the and, point and that I forward. really, that point I really want to bring up is the fact that everybody always used to say if we were on a different motorcycle, because Andrew and I, I was both gonna came get to off that. Harleys, I see the big you know? S on the sleeves. <laughs> and uh, I heard for years, if you guys got on a different motorcycle, you'd get your butts kicked. Well. We're on a different motorcycle, and it's now the heaviest in the class. Well, I think you've been on a different motorcycle more than once, too, <laughs> as I recall. I mean, it, 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 you're on a different motorcycle when you went to the twin. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we talked about this years ago. You know, Byron and Terry, you know, they, they're, they've, they've dealt with it their whole lives as well. I mean, Byron, Andrew, I'd like to say is, uh, I, Byron and I were talking about this the other day. I, I, think, I think Andrew's the next level of Byron, and by saying that, I mean, he's just elevated to a different level. You know, Byron didn't have CNC programs. He didn't understand CAD. He didn't understand all that stuff that Andrew does, and he could take it to that next level. He's designing, engineering a compu uh, an, an engine in computer, can make it fully functional, and test it. Byron would still be out there with his hand mill. Changing jets <laughs> in the carburetor. You know, like <laughs> whittling away at a chunk of aluminum. So 
he's just advanced and got to that point and uh, where he is now today versus where Byron was when he was 30 years old. You know, but really he owes everything. We all owe everything that, that we have now to Byron and, uh, and Terry. But, you know, they've raced every possible manufacturer. Byron's won on a Yamaha. Byron's, you know, Terry's won on a Honda, a Suzuki, a Kawasaki, a, everything. So uh, I just love the history of the company. And to be a part of it, just a small little part of it, is definitely awesome. It was not really predictable, but if you needed to move the bike around at all, it didn't fight you. Welcome back to The Skinny. I'm Ken Stout. It was pretty cool sitting here during a commercial break, and who calls in? Some guy named Terry Vance yep. <laughs> holds the phone up. You want to put him on TV? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> you can't skip those calls usually. No, no, I was like, go ahead and take that one. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, of course, we had the Vance and Hines elite in here as well. Andrew Hines has joined us here at the V-Desk. Eddie Craywick and Gage Herrera, their new rider here for 2023. And we've been talking about Gage's uh, great success here in 2023 with six wins already in the first nine races. Um going to seven finals, eight number one qualifiers. They keep you in front of a microphone, honing those skills as well up in the media tower. That's, that's pretty funny stuff. I want to go back to what you just brought up, Eddie, in the last segment because I, I agree. Everybody thought, man, if they had to go back to an inline four-cylinder and in, endure the challenges that we have now, they wouldn't see that they're, they're not, they weren't as good as they were back in the day. And boom, not only did you do it, I mean, but right out of the gate, you're right in their face, man. Yeah, we, we've been pretty fortunate. I, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it, it, we're always working on stuff in the background, <laughs> you know, is the way to say it. We've had customers with inlines, and, you know, we still do engines for a lot of people out in the class, and uh, we're always doing development. But now, this time, we're heavily developed. We're invested, and we're doing a lot. You know, we're partnered with Suzuki, and we got Missions Help, and everybody moving forward. But... You know, the the engineering and design stuff, I mean, Andrew's really set forth, uh, let's just say, a, I, I don't know, a get-after-it attitude, and he's designed a lot of cool new parts. I wish we could show everybody, you know, but uh, <laughs> well, we, we kind of keep I, it covered. <laughs> hats off to you, by the way. Those little vignettes, those videos that you do on social media where you – you show us a little bit here and there. I love them. I think everybody loves them. Yeah, I, I mean, I try to do that with my social media. You know, fans, friends, everybody out there, you know, just try to educate them a little bit because there's a lot of cool things on our motorcycles that bring it to an advanced level that uh, a lot of other things don't have. Well, we uh, wouldn't know them. We wouldn't see them. You guys, it's a big deal, but just for the average fan, a casual fan looking at that, we... We just wouldn't know. Yeah, it's so we try to, you know, now it's social media and, you know, having that ability to do it. We, we're trying to bring people into what I'd call behind the scenes, behind the shop stuff and doing things. And, you know, like I was mentioning, Andrew designing a lot of new parts. We we showed earlier in the year, you know, new triple clamps or how we designed some stuff to come about. Uh, this year was a really cool task for Andrew and myself. We got to design the, the Gen 3 Hayabusa body uh, for Suzuki. Suzuki said, hey, we want a middle of last year, 2022. They said, we need to have a new body represented in the class. We'd like for you guys to design it. And, uh, you know, that opportunity came up. And for Andrew and I, I think that was that was for sure. It's the future of the class, and it's something that we can see and everybody has. And uh, it was very, uh, very satisfying. Yeah, it was a good project. Luckily, we hit it out of the park, and a lot of people wanted to adapt to that bodywork throughout this year. So I think we have maybe eight of them out yeah. of service now. Well, we went testing, and uh, the very first run, I looked at Andrew. Andrew's like, all right, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll put it on my, you know, put it on. And if I get to 1,000 foot, everything feels good, and I'll stay in it. Well, I pop the clutch. I go. The bike's going, honestly, the straightest it ever did. And uh, I kept it on all the way to the finish line. Went 200 miles an hour on the first lap on the body. Yeah. So Any wind tunnel stuff in the... Or can no. you do that all via... We did some CFD work on it. So okay. so computer wind tunnel, right? So to see how the fluid dynamics work over the surfaces. Um, and a lot of just inherent knowledge that we learned throughout the years working on all the other projects we had done with Harley-Davidson and, and other companies. So uh, Ed made nine tests that runs that day. Gage was testing the new billet cases that we came out for the four cylinder this year for Vance and Hines, which was our, our Achilles heel last year. We were changing cases last year more than we were doing R and D. Cause we would break a brand new set in about five or six runs. 
So when we went testing, Ed had the new Gen 3 body. Gage had our new version cases. And about after the ninth run, I told Ed, I said, we got to put Gage on this thing just to see what he thinks the difference is. He was riding his Gen 2 bodywork from last year. And he hopped right on, and I'll let him tell you how it felt. I mean, it was, uh, it was very neutral. You know, it, it was pr- not really predictable, but if you want, needed to move the bike around at all, it didn't fight you. So it, it was definitely very smooth feeling. You know, I, I was riding with a Gen 2 body that w- weekend. I made, like, four or five passes, and then I got an Ed's bike. And just the difference between the two, I feel like the Gen 2 body, you had to be ready for anything, where the Gen 3 body, it's very neutral. And if the, if there's a crosswind or something, it's definitely easy to maintain. Want to get the skinny on other guests in different types of motorsports? Check out our YouTube page and get the skinny. The skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach. American Coach, innovation is our life force. Welcome back to the skinny. We have the elite here, part of Vance and Hines' team inside of the studio with us. Great to have them as well. Of course, Andrew Hines, Eddie Krawick, and Gage Herrera, their new writer here in 2023. Awesome stuff here for sure. Uh, if you notice the big S on the sleeve, that is for Suzuki. I want to ask you guys, talking to Rob Muzzy, um, back in the day, of course, a lot of drag racing, but a lot of road racing back in the day, and uh, amazing career he had. But he would work with... Uh, with the team, I guess Kawasaki at the time, uh, here in North America, but the challenges were in Japan. So they always had their own vision of how they wanted things done. He had his vision of how he wanted to do things. Um, so there, there was a rub. Are you guys true development partners with Suzuki? Do you work with just North America? Do you work with Japan? Are, you, are they part of the development on the engine? You were talking about how much you guys have done. Uh, I, I would say on the engine side, no. No. Um, we kind of handle that all in-house. When we were designing the body, there was input from North America, and then they had to clear it with Japan and, and kind of go that direction. But luckily, you know, they're, they've been a really good partner for us. Um, they trust us a lot, and they trusted our vision on what we believed was best. Not just vision, but what we knew. And uh, they came to us for that reason. You know, they, they had the trust in us and they knew that we're not going to do anything that's going to compromise in past. Now they've tried developing the prior body and it didn't go as well in a prior engine and it didn't go as well. And, you know, uh, so I would say luckily for us as a company, I mean, we have a very good reputation, uh, working with past manufacturers and everything along those lines. They trusted us. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, I think it'll continue to expand and evolve. Um, but for us, we're just, we want long-term partners. Uh, that's the way that we try to do business. And long-term re- relationships are, I think, what take it to that next level. All right, we've got to end this show. Final segment here. We've got to throw a couple of laughs, a couple of smiles at people. Talk to me. <laughs> There's got to be some shenanigans that go on when a new guy comes to the team. So <laughs> so what, what have they done to you? Anything anything spectacular? Are they lock you in the port of john or anything? <laughs> no, nothing really yet. I'm sure oh, some of Come on, you guys. Well, we were, we were changing the engine one time, and he took the rear tire off for some reason. <laughs> no, we were yeah. trying to figure <laughs> yeah, that one out. Why are you doing? <laughs> we're working on the wrong part I'm of the I'm not going to pick on him, but, you know, like when we went to Vegas. Come on, pick on him right, a little bit. Right, That's we what go we're to doing Vegas, here. he's riding he's my a bike. New guy. He hasn't put it in gear one time, oh, yeah. you know, and it's like you look <laughs> yeah. at him, and we're like, yeah. you think he's nervous being him? Like, it, was that, it was that very first <laughs> run when he was riding Ed's bike for that test session. I was sitting in the water box, and I'm like, Hey, you're gonna put it third. Yeah, you're gonna. Yeah, we do the burnouts the third year, so he's like, "Oh, let me, let me, let me do that." <laughs> and right off the bat, you have to be like, "Damn, yeah, that screwed <laughs> up." We get back to the truck and that's you it. Know I blew, he's I blew it, 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 man. Yeah. I blew it. <laughs> man, I didn't put it in gear, and I was gonna do the burnout. He acted you know? so nonchalant. That would have been bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The night before we tested, we, we after the race on Sunday, we said, "Hey, why don't you come on over to the bike?" You know. We'll see if we need to move the handlebars, brake levers, shift butt, anything like that. Why don't you just throw your leathers on, come over and sit on? He's like, you really want me to put my leathers on? I'm like, yeah, yeah I want you to get the full feel. And he came over and he sat on. He's like, we're good. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So so for you, Gage, what was the one thing you weren't ready for? If there was one thing that you're like, hey, that one caught me off guard, what would it be? As far as riding the motorcycle? Yeah. Or just in general? In general, or riding the bike. Well, in general, it's talking on TV and all that stuff. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Going on the skinny. Yeah. yeah. 
But uh, as far as maybe on, that's why it was so hard to get him to come down maybe. and get off the word. He's probably like secretly Damn, putting it off the entire it. time. He's home drinking a beer and he's like telling you he's busy. He's not, yeah, he's not worried about going to Western Swing for three races. He's worried about coming down and talking to Skinny. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> We're going to wrap things up. Hope you had a good time. Three of the absolute best, courtesy of Vance and Hines. We'll see you next week. <laughs>